in today's video, we're going to learn about option pricing, and in particular, option pricing using the binomial tree. And in the textbook that we use, uh, there, there's a link to that in the description below if you're interested. In the textbook, we look at two approaches to the bi binomial tree. And so for this video, we're going to look at the first one, which is the portfolio approach to pricing options using a binomial tree. Now, it's worth noting that the Black-Scholes model was actually developed before the binomial tree approach, but usually I try and teach the binomial tree model first and then we follow up with the Black-Scholes model. Uh, the reason for this is just that the binomial tree is maybe a little bit easier to understand the intuition of, and both the Black-Scholes and the binomial tree models actually re rely on an awful lot of the same assumptions. You know, they're they're uh, very much, they're quite similar to each other. In, in one is just a discrete time model and the other is a continuous time model. But um, the beauty of the binomial tree model is that it can actually handle a variety of conditions that other models cannot. And so often people think, well, the, the Black-Scholes model, it uses more sophisticated mathematics and thus it's a better model. And that's not really the case, actually. Both, both models are really good models and they're often just suited to different things. So the binomial tree model is slower computationally than the Black-Scholes model, but it's able to handle things like American options, dividends, and it's just more flexible and can be more accurate at times and requires fewer assumptions. So actually both models are really useful and really good. Um, so we're going to learn about the portfolio approach today. And the first step in, in any binomial tree is simply to, uh, is to draw a diagram of the possible paths of the underlying. So we start by just drawing a binomial tree. And in, in this example, we're going to start out with a very basic and unrealistic uh, model. We're going we're gonna to make an awful lot of assumptions that probably, if you're watching this for the first time, you're going to... Uh, sort of say, well, this is entirely unrealistic. You know, this this doesn't seem like a good approach at all. But don't worry, we'll start with this approach, and then what we'll do is, once we understand, we'll use this sort of really basic model to understand the intuition and the theory underlying the models, and then we'll start to add more and more realism. So by the end of our uh, you know little class here on binomial trees, hopefully. They'll make a lot of sense to you, and you'll you'll feel that they they actually are not really quite quite as unrealistic as maybe they at first appear to be. So, the first step, as I said, is to draw a diagram of the possible paths of the underlying, and then what you do is you calculate the present value of the cash flows of the option. So that seems like a reasonable approach to pricing anything. So we have to start with two assumptions in order to build our first binomial tree. One is quite a reasonable assumption. It's that no arbitrages are freely available in the marketplace. And that's not such a crazy assumption to make. Uh, most of the time you would expect that if there were obvious arbitrages available, there's an awful lot of smart people in the finance world that are out there looking for them and they'd probably start trading upon it and try and profit. And actually even in the option space, there's a particularly kind of a smart group of mathematically inclined people who would be looking for this sort of thing. So that's not an unreasonable assumption. Our next assumption is kind of unreasonable, but it's one that we'll be able to fix over time. And that is the assumption that we know with certainty that there are only two possible price outcomes for our underlying. So we're basically saying that we know the price right now, and at some point in the future, we'll say in a month's time, it'll be at one of two prices, and it can't possibly be at any other price. Okay, so that doesn't... I imagine you're watching this and thinking, well, that's not at all reasonable. Is this approach reasonable? It is a reasonable approach, but it gets reasonable when we, when we add more to it. But this will hopefully explain the theory to you. So we're going to just start with an example. We're going to try and price an option. We're going to say that the underlying is trading at $50, and at the end of one month, it's going to either be at $70 or $30. Okay, So it can't go to any other prices. It can't be at $70 and one penny. It can't be at $29. It will only be at one of two prices, and that's 70 or 30 Okay, And then what we're going to try and do is value a European call option on it, 
with a strike of 50, so that's an at-the-money call option, one month to expiration where the interest rate is at 5%. So the first thing we're going to do is draw our tree, okay? And so you can see up here on the screen our first tree, and we fill in the information we know. And so what we know is that the underlying is at 50 right now, so we write that in. And then we know at expiration that the underlying will be at 70 or 30, so we write in in the upside economic scenario, ST equals 70, the underlying is at 70. And in the downside economic scenario, that ST equals 30, okay? So that's the two possible prices it can be at. The next thing we have to do now is to work out what the option will be worth. It's a call option. What will it be worth in these two scenarios? So if you have a call option, which is the right but not the obligation to buy the underlying at the strike price, which is 50, and the underlying is at 70, at expiration, that call option has to be worth the difference between 70 and 50, which is $20. So we're going to write that in as well. A C equals 20 in the upside scenario. Now, in the downside economic scenario, you have the right but not the obligation to buy the underlying at 50, but the underlying is actually trading at 30. So you would not exercise that option. You wouldn't buy at 50 when uh, when you can just go out in the market and buy at 30. So in that scenario, you would just tear up your options contract, throw it away, it's expired worthless, okay? So we write that information in as well. C equals zero in the downside scenario. Our call option is worth nothing, okay? So that is some information. So far, we've just drawn a tree and filled in the information we know, and we've done a tiny calculation, which is what the call option is worth in either scenario. So now for the theory, now for the bit that, uh, that this video is all about. What we want to do here is we want to see if we can set up a portfolio with some amount of the underlying and the derivative, in this case a call option, that, that allows us to know the value of, port, of our portfolio at expiration. By that I mean, is there an amount of the underlying that you could own along with the, uh, along with the call option that in both the upside and the downside economic scenario, uh, you, you'd end up with the exact same amount of money. Now, considering there are only two possible outcomes, right? There's, we're in a world in which this uh, underlying can only be at one of two prices at expiration. Essentially, if we can set up a portfolio like this, we're essentially saying that we have a portfolio that pays us the exact same amount no matter what happens in the economy, right? And if we had a portfolio like that, um, that's a risk-free portfolio, right? Because if, uh, if, if, it, if you have a guaranteed amount of money no matter what happens in, in the economy, that is risk-free. There's no risk. There's no question as to how much money you're going to get. And therefore, if it is risk-free, we can then, we obviously have to present value it, and hopefully it's obvious to you that the rate that we would use to present value it is the risk-free rate, simply because it's a risk-free cash flow. So if there's some amount of the underlying and the call option that we can have in our portfolio um, that gives us the same amount of money in either scenario, we're then able to discount it at the risk-free rate, and we're able to work out the, the fair value of our call option. So let's set up a portfolio that has some amount of the underlying, and we'll call that delta times S. So delta just means some amount of, and S is the underlying, minus C, which is minus the call option. Now, the reason that we have minus the call option, why we're long the underlying and short the call option, is quite simply that the call option being the right but not the obligation to buy, a call option and the stock will both go up in value if the underlying goes up in value, and they'll both fall in value if the underlying falls in value, right? So if we need a portfolio that has the same amount in both the up and the downside scenarios, we need when one is going up for the other to be going down and vice versa. We need them to move inversely to each other. So therefore it needs to be some amount of stock minus the call option, or you could do it the other way around and have minus some amount of the stock plus a call option, but one has to hedge the other. They have to move opposite to each other. Otherwise there'd be no value in which the portfolio is worth the same at expiration.
So let's write that in on our binomial tree. So here on, you can now see on screen our next, uh, next little piece of information in there. So in the upside economic scenario, our portfolio cash flow is going to be 70 times delta because it's some amount of the underlying and the underlying is worth 70 in the upside. And in the downside, it's going to be delta times 30, which is some amount of the underlying when the underlying is worth 30. Minus, in the upside scenario, we've got minus 20, which is the value of the call option in the upside scenario. And in the downside scenario, we've got minus zero, which is the value of the call option in the, uh, in the downside economic scenario. So, in order to work out if there's an amount of the underlying that we can hold that will, make, uh, that, that will give us the same payout in either scenario, we just have to make those two portfolios equal to each other and solve for delta. So we write in delta times 70 minus 20 equals delta times 30, and then we solve for delta. Now in this example, uh, when we solve for delta, we find that the answer is 0.5. So let's look at that. 0.5 times 70 is 35, minus 20 gives us 15 in the upside scenario. In the downside scenario, um, 0.5 times 30 gives us 15, minus 0 is still 15, right? So in either scenario, we have a payout of 15. So we've now worked out that there's some amount of it that we can, of the underlying we can hold that will actually make our portfolio riskless. So if there is a value for delta where the two portfolios are identical at maturity in all possible scenarios, um, we can then just present value that. And then, of course, because it's a portfolio, it contains both the stock and it, it contains some amount of the stock, in our example, half of a share of the stock, and minus a call option, we then just have to strip out the, the amount of the stock and we have to flip the sign on the call option to have the value of the call option. So we take our 15 and we present value it to, to get the, the price of it today. Um, that comes to $14.94. We just present value that with our, our interest rate that we specified early on. And then we work out the, the stock at present is worth $50. We knew that. 0.5 times $50 is 25. So then 25 minus 14.94 gives us $10.06, which is the value of our call option. So that's actually all we have to do. That is the portfolio approach to pricing a, an option using a binomial tree. And so what we've learned here is that there is an interesting result that if we knew the next two possible steps in an underlying assets price, and we assume no arbitrage, we can price the derivative. So in our next video, we're going to look at another approach to doing the same calculation, and we'll also try and find ways of making our assumptions much, much more realistic. So we're going to, we're going to have to solve the problem of the, this big glaring issue that we, we can't possibly know that the underlying will be at one of two possible prices at some point in the future, but we'll be able to work through that and, and get to a reasonable conclusion. And so uh, tune in tomorrow and, and watch that video. See you later. Bye.